Okay, first time that we're gonna be going on a long trip, uh, going to Vegas from Phoenix. Pretty excited, but we've never taken the the Tesla before. So what do you think, Joe? Uh, well, I'm expecting it to be not a big deal, but first time driving electric across the country is about 350 miles. So it's a big deal the first time. And you said earlier, that because we charged it to 97%, 97%, yep. we won't have any regenerative braking. That's what Elon Musk tweeted about a month or two ago, said if it's 100%, regenerative braking doesn't work. Never I'll tried you know. that before. Yeah, I'll let you know. Should be fun. Should be just another trip to Vegas in a beautiful, luxurious car, so that's what we're hoping for. Nice and relaxing, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I put on the little screen since we'll be driving across the desert. This is what it looks like. Looks pretty stupid. <laughs> Did but, you just point to me and say oh, it looks pretty stupid? Looks pretty stupid. <laughs> Not stupid. <laughs> Don't do that while you're driving. <laughs> Regenerative braking works fine at 97% battery. It's fine. Okay, so we are in Avondale, which is the opposite side. Okay, let's just talk about what just happened. I am in cruise control and forgot that I didn't have autopilot engaged. And I started to drift off the line. And I'm like, why is the car not putting me back in the lane? Because I've been driving an autopilot most of the day, or most of this time. Um, you have to pay attention to that. So anyway, we're in Avondale, and our battery percent is now at 81%. So going from one side of Phoenix, because we're on the far southeast side of the city, to the far west side of the city, took about 16% battery. Which, of course, we knew that, but I just wanted to get that on tape. So let's talk about autopilot and full self-driving. Uh, we were just talking because something weird happened. We're going through, there's a there's a construction project. There's no cones or anything, everything's going full speed, but the road is a little bit kind of dug up and messed up. And we get into this place and I'm in autopilot, we don't have full self-driving. And the car just starts slowing down. There's no one in front of me and there is a car behind me. Uh, and that really surprised the car behind me. In fact, he got way back, changed lanes, decided I was a crazy driver. Um, we were just talking about what possibly could have done that. We noticed on, uh, when it goes into a turn, a uh, steep turn, the car will automatically slow down. So maybe it was thinking there was going to be a turn. I don't know, the GPS definitely wouldn't have said there was a turn. We don't know why it slowed down. Uh, this happened while we were trying to figure out how it is possible that a driver would be able to fall asleep in a car, full self-driving or not. We have no idea. When you have to give the steering wheel feedback and weird stuff happens on the road that uh, makes you suddenly alert and want to turn off your autopilot and take control because it's just not behaving exactly as you thought, I, I don't see how it's possible. No, we talked about that. We talked, yeah, that was a weird combination where you're going slow, you do this commute every day, you fully trust full self-driving, you're in stop and go traffic. Somehow you manage to wiggle the steering wheel every 30 seconds so that the alarm doesn't go off and the autopilot doesn't kick off and you fall into a deep, deep sleep right when somebody with a cell phone happens to be looking at you and snapping a picture. Okay. If Mythbusters were to do this, we would say it's plausible, but not likely. I don't know. Anyway, made across the opposite side of Phoenix. In the future, if we were to ever do a complete round trip, it would probably take 40% of the battery on our Model X long range, right? I would suppose so. Yeah. All is going well. Uh, autopilot is awesome. Uh, the one benefit I think with full self-driving that uh, we would get is when we get behind a slow car, it would change lanes for you. Um, I don't know that we would get full self-driving for any additional safety features. 
uh, because I don't think, you know, that one extra thing of being able to change lanes makes the autopilot more safe. Just my feeling, right? Have you seen me park? So look at the dash. <laughs> Show the dash. There, just threw an alarm. Because I was talking and I wasn't wiggling the steering wheel. You don't need to show the dash. Uh, the alarm went off. And soon after that, the autopilot would have kicked off. So, I don't know. I am now going to have to take out autopilot to turn. So this is what I would have to pay $6,000 for right now. Is to make this turn. Oh, man. Why don't we have autopilot to do that? We need full self-driving. Oh, one other thing. Um, we're going west on 202, our normal routes, 202 to I-10. Uh, there's another freeway, 101, that we never take, but it's the same distance either way. The car wanted us to go on 101, so we didn't. And then the route navigation adjusted itself and told us to get off and get back on 101. And we didn't do that because we're just going to go to I-10. It's like five miles past. And we get past the next exit and it says, get off on the next exit, turn around. Anyway, so finally we get through all the exits. And then it gets to the junction on I-10 and it says, get on I-10 south towards, towards Tucson. Tucson, make a U-turn, and then go back north on 10. All the while the freeway is open and all that. There must have been some weird thing with traffic control. Anyway, if we would have had full self-driving, it would have just done what it needed to do, and, and uh, it would have taken us on 101 and we wouldn't have questioned it, but it was a little bit weird. Okay. Okay, we're in Wiki up. We stopped in Wickenburg to add, well, I just plugged it into the supercharger and then went to Bash's, got some coffee and root beer. It added 50 miles, so the computer said by the time we got to Kingman, um, we would have probably 70 miles of range. I don't think we're going to. We'll probably have uh, maybe 40 miles of range, so it'll be interesting to see. I, I think you do need that stop in Kingman. Uh, anyway, we are in Wikia, just got out of it, and I was just talking with Wendy, wondering if we had to, would we be able to, like, find a 220 volt charger someplace I don't know um, possibly probably someone's got to have 220 um, anyway I spent the whole trip from Wickenburg to wiki up in cruise control but not autopilot the roads are just not in great show them the roads yeah I mean this is as good as it gets this is this is actually really good um, but there's places where the lines are gone, grooved up. Um, honestly, I just, I turned it off because I didn't feel safe and I only want to turn it on when I feel safer. So as a, as an autopilot story, I think, I know there's people out there thinking, someday cars are just going to drive everywhere. Um, possibly, but the drivers have to feel safe when they do that. And I turned it off just because I didn't feel entirely safe. Would you agree? I would totally agree. Okay, so ultimate YouTube talker channel. Subscribe down below if you like what we have to say about our first long road trip in the Tesla X going from Phoenix to Las Vegas. We already Knock talked it off. about some <laughs> already talked about some things. So we just went to the, the Kingman supercharger and um, it was interesting we had never went through this before where so in phoenix we only have two supercharging stations and we're not close to any of them so we opted to put a supercharger not a supercharger but a tesla charger in our home so we wouldn't ever have to worry about charging our car it's a mini supercharger it's a mini supercharger a tiny one anyway so we opted to do that so we don't go to superchargers at all we've been to what four yeah since we've owned the car uh pull into kingman all of the chargers are full uh joe was asking me how i felt and after he plugged it in it said that it would take an hour and 15 minutes to charge to get to our destination so i felt a little 
anxiety, like what are we going to do? But here's the thing. When you're in the Tesla, you just accept that that's a trade-off that you make. It's not like pulling in and getting gas where you're there for 10 minutes. You know that you're going to be there for a long time. You hope you're not there for a long time, but in the case where they're all full and the chargers aren't charging at full capacity and you have to share, you just get to the point where you understand that that's what you have to do. Good thing is, is that with the new, the V10 that came out, you get to watch movies and we had some lunch at Carl's Jr. and watched a elderly man try to back up his Tesla oh into a space which was handicap sized handicap sized because it was a handicap one and uh he he it took him probably 10 minutes to get it in there um yeah that was kind of fun and interesting didn't that guy actually get in his car and help him yes uh i have found that tesla owners are extremely nice so the other Tesla owner that was right beside him, uh, because he was having a, a really hard time moving his car around, actually got in his car, moved it for him, showed him some things on his car that he, I don't think he knew. Um, but Tesla owners are all really nice and nobody was angry or fussy or anything. In fact, the one Tesla that was beside us said that his charger was charging at a faster rate than ours was and he was going to leave and had us move over to his look for the a chargers not the b's yes the a chargers are the ones you want to go to they seem to get the juice first but it it wasn't too bad we watched a show and i felt bad because we did as we were sitting there another tesla owner had pulled up and he had to wait and I felt bad. I felt bad that he was sitting there waiting. But once again, when you have cars like this, this is what you sign up for. That's that's just what you do. You know what I think you wouldn't see the best of Tesla owners? If there were 12 cars waiting to get charged. I'm not sure you'd see the best of me if I had to <laughs> wait in 12 cars. Because you can't go to another gas station. There are no other gas stations. Right. It's been fun. It's been interesting. The car rides really nice and it's just a nice, comfortable car. So that is my take on the Kingman Supercharger. The Kingman. But it's funny when we went and drove a couple months ago and checked out the Supercharger, nobody was there. However, side note, there was two cars, two Teslas there that looked like their owner was not around. Carl's Jr. was, there was hardly nobody there. Two Teslas that sat there for the time we got there. Hogging the space. Hogging the space with nobody around. And even when we left, their owners were still not to be found. Tell them about the autopilot feature we want to see on cars. The blue light. Oh, so. As we were driving, we were talking about this. The car does sporadic things every now and then. And you have drivers in ICE cars that do sporadic things as well. And for me being a passenger, it does make it a little nerve wracking to know that those cars are doing sporadic things. Our car does sporadic things. So we were talking about the things that they could improve on when it comes to making these cars safer. And one of them was it would be nice to be able to let the people know behind us that when you are in autopilot or full self-driving that the like say the emblem, the T on the back of the car glows blue. So that's an indication to the other drivers that you are in full self-drive or autopilot to let them know that your car might do sporadic things. 
and that they can either keep their distance or whatever. But just as a, a courtesy to the other drivers, it would be nice to have an indication that your car is driving itself and that and it hits the brakes suddenly sometimes. And, and it hits the brakes suddenly sometimes. Or when it when you go from a off ramp onto an on ramp, your car will veer from one side trying to find the middle because it doesn't have a line. And so when it does come in, if there's a car beside you, you're gonna cut them off. But if they could see that your car has or is in autopilot or full self-drive, it's going to veer over. And eventually, those people would see, oh, so that test was doing this, and it's going to come off. So they would be more than likely to get over in the lane or slow down and give you that space so you're not cutting anybody off. What do you think, Joe? Yes. Self-driving. Step back a little bit. We were also talking that it would be nice to be able to, there's been times that in this trip that our cars just hits the brakes for no apparent reason. And it would be nice to have a little like screen that tells you what it was thinking. Like, you know, shadow over here or what? Squirrel. Squirrel. Right. It'd be nice to, to know what it was thinking. And, and we don't want Waze-like features on our infotainment system. So when it's doing a good job or it's a good stretch of road for self-driving, we want to be able to indicate that. And when it's a bad section of road, we want to push a button to say, probably shouldn't do self-driving here. You yes. Know, for future cars. Yes. Well, and not only that, but it seems to me like it would probably help the road crew to be able to pinpoint how to get that stretch of road a little bit better. Yeah, get some lines painted or something. Or don't have four lines going down the same section of freeway. 100 kilowatts, we were 90 kilowatts at the other place. 150, 153, 154, five, miles an hour. Yay! <laughs> V3 supercharging. V3, baby. 516 miles an hour. So, we got 81 miles. I'm sure that that charging rate doesn't last through the whole charge, but that's pretty cool. 150 kilowatts coming in. The, the icon on the map said it was limited charging, but it doesn't seem to be limited to me. It looks like it's just blasting it in. Uh, on the map, there was a gate code that we had to enter, and then we still got a ticket, so I'm not sure if we're gonna have to pay money or whatever to get out of here, get our car out of Hawk. So let's talk about that spooky ass brake job that happened on the freeway. So we're on Interstate 11, which is the Boulder Bypass now, Boulder City Bypass. It showed up on the map, so that wasn't a problem. Get to the top of the hill and we're coming down. There is a one of those Rental. Vacation America RVs on our right side, and we are passing it. And there is a truck in front of us that's going faster. So he was passing the RV, and we were behind the truck with cruise control on. Five cars span. Yeah, we were set to five car span. We did not have autopilot engaged. Um, we're using the Tesla V10 software. It's it's late October, mid to late October 2019. Uh, anyway, the truck got in front of, he got far enough ahead of the RV that he changed lanes, a perfectly normal maneuver. There was a white SUV behind me that decided that, you know how people like to tailgate. Uh, he was quite close to me. Um, if he were using adaptive cruise control, he would have had it set to about one half. One or one half. He was close. And he was right in my rearview mirror, just hugging my ass. And anyway, this truck got over and opened up the freeway wide open. It and was, we were halfway, like right beside the RV. 
Yes, so we were beside the RV, the truck had got over, and now we had wide open freeway. And so, and we were going maybe eight miles an hour below what the car was programmed to go. Uh, I think we had it set to 75, um, and we were going maybe a little over 65. So the truck gets over, wide open freeway, so the car now at this point is supposed to accelerate, but what does it do? It hits the brakes hard. Hard. And, um, anyway, it hit the brakes hard, and that way, <laughs> <laughs> that white SUV must have shit bricks because he got so far behind me after that moment happened. So, and we were totally caught off guard. We were, we were paying attention, but the, the sensation of the brakes, I mean, the collision avoidance kicked in for goodness knows what reason. Um, so I flicked off the cruise control, got it back up to speed. And then that white SUV gave me plenty, <laughs> plenty of speed, but um, from then on, it was another like 25 miles into Vegas. Uh, it was really difficult to trust the cruise control. What is that sound? It's the fans when oh, it's charging okay. at this speed. Yeah, it was doing it in Kingman too. Oh, okay. Yeah, the fans were while we were watching the video. Oh, okay. Um, oh wow, we started at eight, 79 miles. We're already up to 114 in climbing, and it's only been it's a three minute video. Jeez, that's nice. We're at 160 kilowatts. 160 now, so, woo! It's put in 30. It's added 37 since I started this video. 38. And it's charging at 532 miles per hour. This is the Tesla, what is it, The it's a Model X, it's a Raven. It, we bought it in late September 2019, so I think it's their Raven class that has dual the- motor. The dual motor, and I think, it, I think, I keep seeing stuff on the forums that say, we don't have the V3 supercharger. Well, guess what? Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah, I, I don't know what that means, but I, I think it means that it has the V3 supercharging capabilities because it's just putting in a bajillion of miles per hour. Fans are on high, keeping the battery cool and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, it seems to be working fine. Anyway, that, that little braking maneuver, that spooked us. Um, yeah, look, Wendy's stressed out. We're all glistening now. We were perfectly happy the whole ride, just trusting our autopilot or, or just the cruise control, depending on conditions. And then this happens. And now all of a sudden, we're just like even more paying attention when the autopilot's on. Um, and I, I tell you, Tesla, um, you know, trust, it's, it's earned in drips. And up to this point, we were starting to get to maximum trust in the system and its capabilities and its limitations. And then this weird thing happens. Um, and then our trust kind of goes down to almost zero. So now we're back to just trying to rebuild our trust that the autopilot or the cruise control, we were only in cruise control, adaptive cruise control. Okay, so it does have auto steer. Uh, this is the autopilot setting. So autopilot wasn't even engaged. Um, Let's see, what do I want to show on this? I mean, these were my settings. The emergency lane departure avoidance, that wouldn't have been it. Blind spot collision warning chime, it didn't do that. No. Automatic emergency braking. I, I actually... think it did that. And then obstacle aware acceleration, it didn't do that. But honestly, I don't think, because this is the autopilot screen, I don't think it did any of this. Uh, let's see what it has. Yeah, the cruise control settings don't seem to have, I don't know what other cruise settings there are. I mean, this all looks normal to me, right? I can't see any other weird, oh, navigation? No, gotta hide the VIN. So yeah, we're using version 10. So anyway, it was a little bit, it was a spook. I mean, at the end of the day, it was just a break. It break, it hit the brakes at a, at a, you know, kind of a bad time because we were expecting it not to hit the brakes and there was somebody tailgating us. And, you know, went, from the day we got this car, Wendy and I said, if we get hit, if we get in an accident, it's gonna be from the rear because somebody's following too close and the car just hits the brakes and we don't know why, it's an autopilot. And what's that gonna look like from a liability perspective? It's, it's the drivers behind us' responsibility to drive at a safe distance. So I think it's their fault if they were to hit us. But isn't it, our responsibility to not break when there's nothing there. Well, there's no rules that say you can't just hit the brakes on the freeway, as far as I know. So, but regardless, it, it does lower the trust in the computer guided cruise control system that um, also has collision avoidance. I don't know where the setting is on it, um, but uh, it was a little bit nerve wracking. And Wendy was pretty stressed out for the rest of the trip. And 
But anyway, we got into Vegas. Other than that... <laughs> but here's the thing. I still love the car. We still love the car. Yeah. I mean, you know, and and we, at the end of the day, it's still a car. But it's comfortable. I love the advancements. I just, like I said, I wish there was a warning of of something that an event was gonna occur. But as we spoke earlier, the fact of it is, is that the self-driving cars, although everybody wants to think they're right around the corner, so many things are unpredictable. Yeah, a, we... A bag floating across the road could be considered a collision hazard, and it's gonna stop like that. It's gonna immediately weed. stop. A tumbleweed going across the road. What's it? Right. What's it going to do when the cameras pick it up and decide right. that's a person walking across the freeway? Right. Um, Cardboard. Yeah. Sliding when you're driving across, across the desert, you just see so many things that need to be taken care of for full self-driving to work. So, you know, I would have put full self-driving level four autonomy maybe maybe ten years out uh, from today, from 2019. Um, now, having gone through it with one drive, this is just a you know it's a 320 mile drive for us. Um, I put it out another 10 or 15 years. But here's the thing, as we were talking earlier about the indication light, the blue light, you know, a blue T or something that goes on when you are in Yeah, something that to warn mode, that driver behind that us. That guy would not have been following that if, close. If he knew I was an autopilot and our car is could be prone to sudden braking, um, you know, he might have kept a safer distance and then it would have been no big deal at all. We've just right. been like, oh, sudden braking, whatever. But he had no idea that, well, that we, we were no an autopilot. Idea that was going to happen. And we were not an autopilot. He had no idea that we had collision avoiding adaptive cruise control that might, when the sun conditions and the road conditions and the vehicle conditions are just right, might break suddenly on a freeway going 70 miles an hour. Uh, and that's unfortunate. I think some sort of visual indicator in the back of a car would be an important safety feature for everybody. It's going to yeah. reduce rear endings, reduce collision reports, um, reduce insurance claims. And, and I think such a thing might actually be considered mandatory, just something that's visible. So the people behind you know um, what that car in front of them is doing and that it's a computer driving it. Well, not only in that case, but also with the smart summons in parking lots, having it a blue light or a some, some sort of signal indicator yeah. this is a... on in the parking lot so people can know that there is not a physical driver that it could you know drive in in a sporadic way and they need to pay attention yeah yeah i think uh lawmakers you know you're you're, you're wondering what you can do to help out with the the self-driving thing during this transition where where people are, you know, they're acquiring cars that, you know, granted their technology is listed beta, but you can turn it on and you're running it on the road. Um, you know, if, if you could just add a regulation, just, you know, remember the Cyclops light in the 80s? How all of a sudden every, all cars needed that came out needed to have the Cyclops light? Um, by the way, big mistake, you didn't anticipate cars that are going to need to be able to see stoplights and now they're going to see Cyclops lights and start freaking out um, by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you that made the rules in the 80s, you blew it. Uh, you just made it that much harder to detect stop signs and stoplights, but whatever. Um, but a visual indicator that a car is being computer driven. Um, even in parking lots with a car doing summon, I think uh, I think regulators should really strongly consider that. It's a no-brainer. It's just a light bulb. But make make no mistake. Nobody wants to. I definitely don't want to stop the innovation. Oh of, gosh, no, no. Of that. This I, is the best thing that's ever happened on the road. Um, I think I we felt so much safer driving. The car just slows down when the brake lights come on in front of us. The car is so much safer with these safety features. Um, and I'm really a fan and yeah, don't get us wrong, but Hey, if you have an opportunity to make it safer and it's cheap and it's easy, right. um, let's do it, right. you know? And I think it'll reassure drivers. It'll reassure the public who doesn't know anything about this technology and they're not driving it, that, uh, everything is, it's going to be okay. Right. All right. I'm going to flip over to the charger real quick. All the batteries. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. Yeah. I like it a lot. Already at 180 miles. That's awesome. When will we stop? Stop Are we what? going all the way? Well, 
We're we don't here. even have time to watch a video. But we're here. Wendy wants to stick it out. Get the full 280 miles. Actually, let me see. Do we have it? Yeah, we have it set to set limit. <gasps> I have it set to 100%. Let's go down to just set it back to 80. See, we're only going to be here for 30 so There's minutes. a half hour remaining to get us to um, 100 or to 280 miles, basically, which is 80%, which will be good for driving around Vegas before we have to. Jeez, sorry it's so wobbly. Um, drive around Vegas before we have to go home and then we'll charge it one more time. There's a destination charger at the Aria, but the last time we were here was completely full. It'd well, be they nice. They only have to, four spots. They've got four spots. It's For a, a, whole, a whole hotel. Yeah, it's a 220 volt charger. So we're just going to take care of it here at the supercharger because it's fast. And we have 30 minutes left until we're done. So we get to watch some more Netflix. Uh huh. Netflix, turn it on. One more thing. So we've been here not very long, actually, maybe 25 minutes. We're almost done. And we watched our video. There's nobody at this supercharging station. It's a V3 supercharging. Zero. There's zero, zero cars here. There was one when we pulled in and it was an Uber. It was an Uber yeah, there tester. was an Uber, an Uber guy, Uber driver charging his car and he's gone. Um, there's a couple chest Teslas at the V2 superchargers. Maybe that's a destination supercharger. I don't know. Um, but there's nobody at the V3. Nobody's come in the whole time. What the heck? Because this is the future, man. We're we're almost done. Uh, we got we're charging at 35 kilowatts an hour, which is 116 miles an hour. We got five minutes left um, before we're done, and we've got it's put 271 in 100, miles. It's put in 194 miles so far. 194 in so far. Yeah. Ridiculous. In 20 Ridiculous. minutes. This is the future. Minutes. These V3s are the shizzle. Um, I wish they had a setup this big in Kingman where uh, there were so many cars. That would have been awesome. And there wouldn't have been any cars because when you're charging so quick, nobody's lingering. Um, that's pretty cool. But there's nobody here. It's Vegas on a, Vegas. Sunday. a Sunday. There's a million bajillion quintillion cars out here. And apparently they're all gas cars. So if you're worried about buying a Tesla because there's no superchargers remaining, well, I don't know. Um, cause apparently it seems pretty spotty, but this is kind of prime time cruising time and there's nobody here charging their car. We actually were told that this was a pay parking lot. And we don't know. We got and a we ticket. We might have to pay to get out. We we'll might see. have to. You but might. you'd think if you had to pay to come in, they would tell you. Like they're not going to have you go at the gate and they're going to say, know. oh, give me 20 bucks now. We might. It's Vegas. Maybe. Who knows? What happens Vegas, in Vegas? Vegas ain't stays cheap. In Vegas. Okay. In addition to the, I just asked you if they could put more of these on. Does it cost them more? Oh, yeah. So just to make it perfectly clear, we bought our Tesla and we had free charging. We had free supercharging. We have free yeah. supercharging. For so, life, it says. So we'll, we'll see if that matters here. We don't normally get charged for supercharging. This is V3 supercharging. Right. So it could change, but I don't think it will. But so it makes me question if you don't have free supercharging, would it cost more per kilowatt hour to charge here versus the the just regular Tesla oh, it does, supercharging? Yeah. Cuz this ha this supercharger has a megawatt of power. That's what they brought in to bring this thing up. Right. But when you as an owner charge at a regular Tesla supercharger, oh. you pay a certain rate. So does it cost more to come to the to we'll the We'll never know. I don't think we'll know cuz we have free supercharging. So right. someone else is going to have to figure that one out. That would be interesting to know. Yeah. It means you know how much it'll cost to get out of this parking lot. <laughs> we'll see. But I I like all the open space and Yeah, there's tons of space at this V3 supercharger. Yep. I should video it, but I'm not going to. Oh my God. V3 supercharging, utterly awesome. Free. And free. Just got out of the parking lot and no place to pay. Just stick your ticket in and you are good to go. Free supercharge, free V3 charge. Zero gas, zero emissions, all the way here, all the way to Vegas and free supercharging. Bueno!
destination chargers are all full. Can, you can say it. So, he asked if we were low emissions <laughs> or alternative fuel. And so I only had to say, did we let out any emissions while we were on our trip? <laughs> no. Are we alternative fuel? Yes. I guess if anybody's alternative fuel, it's us. An electric car would be. Amen. Takes some getting used to. <laughs>